If this is the talk you're expecting, you are in the right place. Growing your contributing role in Kubernetes, and particularly from uh, the perspective of a release team member. And not just a release team member, but sort of a, a newbie release team member. So I'm a Kubernetes newbie. I only really got involved in Kubernetes in 2017. I've only been an org member since 2018. But in 2018, I joined the 110 release team as an issue triage shadow. And then for the current release, 111, I become the issue triage lead. So while I'm a newbie on Kubernetes, I am also an experienced software engineer. I've been doing open source for about 20 years. I've kind of made my career in it. So I, worked in, I currently work in VMware's open source program office, but I also did open source Linux work all the way across the whole stack. Like I'm literally the full stack developer, drivers, kernels, Linux distros, all the way up through cloud orchestration now. And I, I mention this because like, I'm a software engineer, and this talk is really kind of about software engineering. The release team is about the software lifecycle of Kubernetes. And so I've got this huge word cloud here, and I, I bring it up because I often hear from newcomers that, well, I don't have enough experience. But programming and like certain aspects of experience that maybe you're weak in, those are only one part of the bigger software engineering story. And anything that you maybe are feeling some trepidation about or you, you don't think you have enough experience in this or that, that's all an opportunity. It's an opportunity to, low, to learn and grow in areas where you don't have experience yet. It's also an opportunity to lead and share your experiences with others. So, People say I never do a poll in a presentation, but I'm going to move out here where I can actually see you. So who's new to Kubernetes here? Good. I'm glad you showed up. Welcome. Who, which of you, and you can raise your hand multiple times, who's looking to grow in your, your contributor role in Kubernetes? Nice. And don't touch that. Um, who's new to software development? I figured so, yeah. So that's kind of why I had those prior slides. Like, it's OK. And I presume then even those people that aren't new to software development, you're probably looking to While they are coming to switch that, I will try to talk very loud. I've got these little icons here next to each of those things. So there are, there are some things for you to be able to watch for in the presentation. All right, so I recently became an org member. And this is like a frequently asked question in the community. What, what is an org member? What does it mean? And it's really your first step up from being a casual or new contributor. And technically, it means you're a member of the org on GitHub for Kubernetes. And with this comes some, some basic abilities. You can add certain labels. Your PRs are automatically going to go through continuous integration testing. But with it also comes some responsibility. Like It says up there that you are an active contributor in the community. That said, the bar for membership is relatively low. Aaron here likes to say, like, you just need to be showing sustained presence and activity. So it, it's relatively abstract. It's not that hard to do. You shouldn't be too hung up with it. If you're getting involved in doing stuff, you're probably past the bar. Now, the, the other three levels there, and I, I probably should have inverted this. We talk about this being the contributor ladder. And as you work your way up the ladder, it's down in the graph. But beyond being a member, the other three levels really start to come into ownership and you're taking ownership over areas of code. What we really want in open source is to avoid the tragedy of the commons, the idea that we have something shared, code or aspects of the project that nobody owns, nobody's responsible for, and that they sort of die off over time. So the, the latter is kind of about helping to ensure that we, we have clear ownership on things for those reasons. So new contributors, new developers, obviously, 
think about becoming members. As you're trying to advance through your, your membership in Kubernetes, it's pretty obvious where you're headed. And if you're trying to become an advanced developer, you're, you're aiming to be more of a, an owner. Pretty, pretty obvious stuff. So the release process. So I mentioned that I was on the release team for 1.10 and now for, for 1.11. This is kind of normal, agile software development open source. Stuff's moving pretty fast. A three month cycle, maybe some things are a little slower, other things are faster, but that's kind of the, the cycle. You've got some feature definition that happens, feature work, bug fixing, and the release. But um, the reality is that like feature work is actually happening all the time, bug work is happening all the time, so these things become a little more fuzzy. Now, Multiple talks today, and also yesterday at the Contributor Summit, if you were there, mentioned the release team as an entry path. So this is the people who are on the 110 release. You see me over there as a shadow. Like I said, I'm a new person. 111 comes around, I've moved over to a lead on the role. So I'm already getting more responsibility, and there are multiple other people on that list. But new shadows came along. So this presents an opportunity if you're a newcomer looking to advance to maybe step into some of those areas. And there are a few here that I've kind of highlighted as what areas that I think of ones as maybe a little easier than others to get in at gauge depending on your experience level. And then especially if you're just a new developer, testing is a way I feel I find useful to approach code. If I see a test that's failing, well, I can go read the test case, I can go read the code associated to it, and it sort of becomes an entry path to understanding. Now, I may not be the person who ultimately understands and fixes the bug, but it's an entry path for me. Now, great if I actually find and solve it, cool, but it's something that you can use as an entryway. But I also think about this as sort of, it's not just a release process, but it's a volunteer process. Any of you could get involved and use it as a way to take a next step. And that's because it's happening all the time. This isn't just a static thing that happens during three months. It's happening four times a year. And then beyond that also, we have stable patch releases for prior releases, and those prior releases get support for a number of subsequent releases. So each one of these might actually be a 12-month continuum. And for the folks who are looking to advance, in particular, who already have some level of, of experience, it's not possible today because of some, I guess, legacy Googleisms. The, the way the release is released, you currently do have to be a Google employee. But we've started kind of kicking around. And earlier today, there was a question I think about it: um, Can we decouple there? And if that's the case, and you're thinking, well, I could never do that because I'm not a Google employee. Maybe if you've kind of grown in the community over the next year, by that point, this might be decoupled, and it could be your place to engage for your, your next leveling up. So issue triager. I mentioned that that was the role that I have. And every presentation needs kittens. So here are my kittens. And bonus points in particular, if you look at the cats, some of them are kind of grumpy, some of them are groggy, some are a little more active, some maybe seem happy. Like software engineers, that's us on any given day. And as issue triager, you sort of become a cat herder. You have to understand what all these developers are going through and doing and, and figure out how to get resolution on something. So the issue triager is mostly pulling bugs and checking status on development activities. To do that, we're interacting with other contributors, especially with SIG leads. We're sending them reminders on things that are going on or having to reach out and ask questions and then publishing summary reports on that stuff. If you're a particularly experienced developer, something that you might bring to a role like this is just the gut level intuition. Like you, you see something that's a problem. And Jace, who's sitting down here, the, the lead of the last release, I think he did a, a good job of kind of reaching out and leveraging the whole team to say like, okay, are we worried about this? And if you bring a certain level of engineering experience already, that's something that you could especially add to the conversation, I think. Not that you couldn't also be a completely new contributor in some of these roles. So the issue treasurer does not do the actual work. Like we're kind of the, the cat herder. The cats are the cats are doing their things. So what this means is we're we're doing a lot of reading of issues in GitHub, of email discussions. Slack conversations, things like that, but we're, we're not actually typically looking at code very much. 
So then what are we looking at? Those things that I just mentioned for the most part, Slack, Google Groups, but also within that, we, we might have to be looking at test results and attending SIG meetings. So having talked about issue triage, it's important to think about, well, what is an issue? So an issue is obviously a GitHub thing, but it's really just a bucket. Any source code management system or project management system has some bucket like this, and it gets its meaning through the way the project uses it. So on GitHub, you, you see this thing that says 2,000 issues or 5,000 issues for, for Kubernetes, but there's kind of a first pass splitting. You've got things that have a label that indicate they're a bug or a feature. And as the issue treasure, this would make life really easy if that's what it was, because there's somebody whose job is focused on features, issue triage, I'm focused on bugs. The reality is that we have a whole bunch of kinds of issues, and it's really kind of then a, a label soup. Earlier today, Aaron mentioned that after some cleaning and consolidating, we're down to something like 170 labels, and down from like 220, so this becomes very complicated to track and understand. But within that, again, is some opportunity. We're, we're having discussions. I'm also active in the contributor experience SIG. We're having discussions around how do, we, how do we make it more inviting for all of you who are new, and part of that is the principle of least surprise. If things are surprising and confusing, that's bad for the contributor experience. But some of us who've been around, even myself, even just a year or so, having gotten used to these things, we take them for granted. So as newcomers, raise your hand and speak up and say, like, this is confusing. And your opinion is valuable, and we would value it, and would love to hear your perspective on these things. And not just on labels. Anything in the project that you see like that, find your voice and, and share your experience. It's valuable. So if you are a member, like if, you've, if you're completely new and you've worked your way up to membership, there's a, a couple of actions that you can do just around checking label status on new issues. That's a, a very valuable type of chopping wood and carrying water that we, we look for people to do. So you might see an issue that clearly has wrong labels, fix them. Or if you're not sure, reach out to, to the SIG that seems appropriate for it and say, hey, is this right? Or if there's already an owner on the issue, say, hey, are these, these labels right? Could, they, could, could things be more clear? And then um, the needs okay to test label is something that's always useful for people to add. If it's a support question, helping people find the right support path by labeling it a, a support ticket. Or quite commonly, things don't yet have a SIG. We're getting automation that's helping with that, I think, in the, the future, but in the meantime, helping point things to the right places means that humans start seeing them sooner. And these are all valuable and relatively simple, simple tasks that you can perform. So I'm starting to get old. You might not be able to see my gray hair up here. I've got kids in college now. And sometimes you have to have the talk. Where, where do issues come from? <laughs> and we're in Copenhagen, so we have to, have to reference Hans Christian Andersen here. And Issues mostly come from humans, believe it or not. So of the two main types, bugs, mostly getting filed by humans at the, the basic level. And these can be people inside and outside of Kubernetes. And especially if they're outside of Kubernetes, they're less likely to set the labels. So it becomes an opportunity for doing issue triage and understanding and what's going on and getting it directed to the right place. Features maybe a little less so because they're going to be generated mostly by humans inside the project and SIGs. But sometimes they come from outside as well. But then test failures, these are really going to be coming as a result of test automation. And briefly before I go into testing, I want to mention that a lot of projects in open source, if you've, you've seen other open source things, um, you might have a requirement to do a pull request that you have an issue first, and that the, the pull request is fixing the issue. It kind of makes sense. But this also leads to sort of a bureaucratic overhead, and a lot of times then it just kind of gets punted away. And in Kubernetes, we've done that now just to streamline things. But as an issue triager, I have to figure out those mappings if they aren't there explicitly. A PR may not be connected to an issue, so I'm constantly hunting around to find the issues that are associated with it. So on testing, we have a thing called test grid, and it's this 
big matrix on, if you go to that URL, you'll see it. Each of these is a little tile that you can click on. And tracking what's going on within these, when you click on it, you see a whole bunch of test results and failures are generally highlighted. Um, that's a massive job. And thankfully, as the issue treasurer, it's not my job. <laughs> there is on the release team somebody who's dedicated to understanding the signal coming out of the continuous integration. But it also still becomes sort of a side job for me because I do need to have some breadth of understanding there if, if I'm needing to help ping a SIG lead or figure out what, what the hangup is on some particular issue or we're getting down to crunch time and everybody on the release team is watching test status trying to understand, are we getting better? And I mentioned that because I think that it, that is something that newcomers can do as well. And like I mentioned earlier, where I see tests and test cases as a pathway to understanding their associated functional code, at any level across the experience spectrum, that's something that you can do. There's three main types of tests in Kubernetes, unit, integration, and end-to-end. -end. In that order, they get more complex. Unit tests are something that you can do just uh, effectively a simple go test and it's isolated, the code is right there in a particular directory, you can run the test of one particular piece of Go code and, and you can play around and understand what's going on. You could break the test, you could change the test, does it still pass? So that's a good, I find, way to, to get into something new. The integration tests require other components. You can still run them locally on your machine, but might start getting a little more complex. And then the end-to-end, -end, those are things that are running in clusters, so they start becoming more complex. But if you come to this with a lot of experience, that may, may be a place where you can actually engage and be a valued contributor. And I, I want to call that, that type of thing out because a lot of new contributor talks like this focus on just the new contributor who's also new to engineering. But we also often do have new contributors who are experienced in engineering, and you bring certain unique skills that are valuable as well. So great way to advance and be proactive as, a, as somebody looking to do more in Kubernetes, looking at test grid, understand what's going on, and, and contributing, but also a gateway to understanding the code more yourself. And like I said, if you're an advanced developer, some, some unique things that you can offer there. In particular, again, Aaron sitting here in the front row, earlier today he mentioned that something like, you have, if you have a PR, a pull request that's changing some code, or maybe it's even just changing documentation, like you know it can't break anything. That PR only has like a 75% chance of passing the, the tests. So you know, more or less, and there's some tricks that make the impact actually smaller. We actually have a, a pretty smoothly running pipeline because of the tricks. But what this means is that maybe there's some cruft in test cases, maybe there's some complex test case, cases, brittle test cases, especially the skilled engineer in the room who's getting involved in Kubernetes, this is a great place that you might be able to engage and contribute something. So that test grid, it looks a lot like the SIG list grid. And as issue treasurer, I need to have a broad overview of what SIGs are what, who's doing what. The, the reason for that is that any time, any moment on the, the release team, we don't know whose problem is gating us or blocking us. I mean, we might, but sometimes, like, in the 110 release, we had a, an odd scalability performance problem, but was it the scaling team's problem, a problem with tests, or the infrastructure that ran the test? Had some piece of code merged from any of the SIGs that broke things? So being able to, to broadly understand who's responsible for what and reach out and, and query them on things is, is really useful in the release team. But also, again, anywhere in the spectrum of being a newcomer to whether engineering or Kubernetes, this could be an entry point for you. If you don't know much about Kubernetes or you've only started dabbling in one point but you're wanting to spread out, if you attend a SIG release meeting series for a while, you might see how we do the whittling down and, and reach out and understand different SIGs and you might learn more about SIGs like that. So how do you learn about SIGs? One thing that I would suggest for newcomers right now especially is charter documents. Each of the SIGs right now is working on a charter and within that they're defining their roles and responsibilities. So as issue triage on the release team, we need to figure out like who's responsible for what. And, and that's why I have an interest in seeing these get more defined. But as a newcomer, like seeing the roles and responsibilities documented, it's your opportunity to say like, hey, could I take on leading that role? 
or could I shadow that role? Now, all of those SIGs can mean meetings, meetings, meetings. And meetings have a bad rep. <laughs> this slide's been around since forever. Like, I think I first saw it mimeographed in somebody's cubicle before, like, each of us at work had our own computer. So this has been around forever. Like, are you lonely, tired of working on your own? Do you hate making decisions? Hold a meeting, see people, feel important, eat donuts, all on company time. But don't hate on meetings, because, like, Meetings is how Kubernetes is made. And yes, the, the volume of all the different meetings, it can be daunting, but it's approachable. So the, the link at the top of the page here is like, I think for me on the release team, but also just sort of in general on Kubernetes, if, if there is one link you could remember, that's the one. It's a jumping point to information on kind of everything, I feel like. Uh, if you go to that link, there is a calendar of all the meetings. And if you click on a meeting, so such as the community meeting, you've got a link in there to the Zoom to connect to the meeting to, to see and watch it, and a link to a Google Doc that is the, um, the agenda for that meeting. Now, that community meeting is kind of the place to go to get an overall orientation to things that are happening in an ongoing basis. But if you're new, it could be your initial engagement point also. Because every meeting, there are a couple of SIGs talking about what they're up to. And the SIGs then cycle through every quarter. So if you attend this meeting on an ongoing basis across the year, you're really going to start to get an organic sense built up of what all of the SIGs are doing, what they're up to, where they're going. If you attend the release meetings, I think you get some of that as well. And would love for people to participate in the release meetings. The steering committee records their meetings and publishes them. It can be a great way to get some insight into the thinking of some of these senior established people and the overall project thinking, similar for SIG architecture. And then obviously each SIG and work group has its own meetings. Now, as a newcomer, so I mentioned that the, the community meeting has that agenda there on a Google Doc. Most of the SIGs have that type of thing. And as a newcomer, you can either go and just type in something you'd like to, to propose for the agenda or put the Google Doc in suggesting mode and suggest something for the agenda. I really encourage you to do that. If you have a question, ask it. Now, it can be intimidating to find your voice and try that. But like speaking from experience, the SIG release team, or the, the release team being involved in SIG release, made me go do that. And it was intimidating at first to show up in a random SIG and put something on the agenda and be saying, hey, you guys have something broken. We need to figure out what's wrong here. Like, it's not just showing up and saying, like, I have a question I'd like contr to contribute to helping you guys in positive. Like, no, I'm showing up potentially the, the bad guy even. But every SIG was welcoming and inviting. And I really encourage you to, to use sort of that newbie card that you have to, to even ask questions. Say, hey, I'm, I'm curious about the, the design of this particular component. What's going on in it? Could we maybe have a little discussion on that? And lately, the SIGs are starting to shift some of their time over specifically to that type of discussion. So I think it's a, a great opportunity as a newcomer. So that brings me to more formal bits of leadership. So if you're asking questions in a SIG meeting, hopefully the, the senior leads are, are answering them. But there, there's other ways that you can get that level of engagement. So open source projects, communities grow over time. Kubernetes started with just a couple people, and it started growing beyond that and got bigger and bigger. And we start getting more and more newcomers. And then suddenly, like this is the set of people who said they were going to come to this talk. Like Things start to snowball. and. This is awesome. This is how things work. You, you get senior members mentoring newcomers because they realize that they need to spread their load, they need a sustainable community, and need to avoid burnout, and they need to do succession planning. That over time, maybe they're going to move on to something else. They need to have you all built up and ready to, to take their place. So any level, you have an opportunity to, to grow and be the next generation of people on this project. If, so I'm guessing some of you might have been here in the last presentation that was done by Paris Pittman, but if not, check it out when the videos are online. She goes into a whole lot more detail on these, but I'm just briefly mentioning the, the formal bits of mentoring that are going on. So once a month, there's a Meet Our Contributors where you can post messages on Slack and Twitter and get live responses 
via Zoom from people who are, are fielding those questions. There are group mentoring cohorts that are aimed at, say, bringing on a set of new contributors or bringing ex some existing contributors up to membership or membership up to reviewer and, and building, building the community in that regard. The one-on-one -on -one hour is a way where you could reach out and get somebody's time committed for an hour to go over a specific thing that you're curious about knowing more about. And then Google Summer of Code and Outreachy, those are obviously much more formal pro programs, but if they're applicable to you and you're interested in maybe using that as an entry point, by all means, go for it. So with that, I, I hope you guys kind of go out there, get active, get doing things, try to grow and go do great things in Kubernetes. Pick some SIGs to focus on, maybe, maybe a couple. Really start attending their meetings, following what they do. Look at their issues and PRs and what you can learn. Look at the types of code reviews that people do on those and, and, and learn from them. And as you learn the code and test cases, you'll start to understand the designs and weaknesses. You can start to contribute to the issue backlog, look for help wanted or good first issues. And, and really find your voice. This is a very welcoming community. Ask questions, write down the answers, and then start teaching others because there's going to be others following you. And if you're, if you're in a SIG meeting or other places, raise your hand and ask for mentoring. If it's something that's just beyond your ability, challenge yourself, stretch yourself, and then take that and, and try to lead yourself and teach others. So that was, that was it for the talk. A few shout outs and thank yous. Some people who have contributed, especially the contributor experience and SIG release team and then a number of individuals there. And Noah Abrams in the audience here, he did an awesome blog post that's linked there describing his journey through this as well as a, as a total newcomer, right? So um, the slides are online if you want to reference anything. I know I kind of flew through them fast. There's a variety of links and things there, but they're already online and ready for you. So. I appreciate you coming, and any questions? Uh, so what sort of time commitment could I expect if I wanted to serve one of the roles? And if I didn't have that kind of time, like what sort of credit or, or how could I contribute anyway? Awesome question. So release team starts out early in the process meeting once a week. So you're, if you're a shadow and you're just learning about a role, you might literally only have that once a week hour. And then later in the cycle, it becomes three times a week and then every day, Monday through Friday, right at the end. So hour, hour long meetings. And then early on, the meetings are often shorter than that. So it may be on average kind of an hour a week to, to try shadowing. Uh, some of the roles have multiple shadows, and I think that's a great idea because maybe you find that you have a time commitment issue, or maybe you shadow a few times over the course of a few releases and slowly take it in. But I think um, to shadow and get your feet wet kind of an hour a week might be all it takes on the release team. And I, I think that's doable. Like, all of you could could carve, if you're really passionate about getting involved like an hour a week, like that's a great starting point. So say you're a developer and you've got a few PRs into Kubernetes now and you're looking to get that mentorship so you can become a member. Um, do you just like pick random people that have looked at your PRs and email them and say, hey, would you sponsor me? Or is there like a formal process for that? or? Spiff XP <laughs> or Aaron Crickenberger, he will sponsor you. Um, I th to some extent, it's going to depend on the SIG. So some SIGs leads are looking for more. But I think your, your initial question, yeah, if, if you're just going for membership, looking around the people who've been involved and understand your work, those are the people who understand what you, you are bringing to the table and they're the ones who are going to vouch for you. And ideally, the bar is, is relatively low. But if if you've, um, say you've done two commits versus 20 commits, at some point it becomes obvious, like anybody's going to vouch for you. I just, tack on, I just want to tack onto that real quick. Like you used to have direct, you used to need direct write access to the repo in order to do anything meaningful. And we've worked really hard today so that you, 
you just need to be a member. That's why I'm super enthusiastic to like vouch for anybody who wants to become a member. There used to be a bar of like you have to have five PRs and somebody has to vouch for it and stuff. But all I ask is some show of commitment. And if you've said more than one PR and you're interested in participating in anything release related, that's a strong enough signal for me. Like so, I I encourage anybody who's thinking in any way, shape, or form of helping out with Kubernetes to like just go for a work membership and please ping me on Slack. I hope I don't get a ton of spam for that, but like really just, it's it's a super low barrier to entry. And what it gets you is the ability to like slash LGTM PRs, close really stale issues or reopen issues that were accidentally closed. All super useful and helpful stuff. I would also add one other aspect. Um, Say you reach out to those people, and, and this is this is part of like just finding your voice. It's okay to ask. The worst thing that's going to happen is they're going to say, you know, I'd, I'll sponsor you when you've done X, Y, and Z, and now you have your to-do list. Now, ideally, the bar isn't that high, but if for some reason there's something you haven't done that the the leads that you're wanting to associate with want from you, they're going to tell you, and and it's it's not a bad thing. That's that's now your to-do list, and go do it. All right, well, I thank you all for coming, and I look forward to seeing you all making PRs and becoming members and active in the community. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.